All right, take your Bible and open to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start there and then I want to jump in. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 16. The Bible says, All Scripture, everybody say all. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Lord, before I forget, I come before you and I ask that you will use me this morning. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for this time. Thank you for these people. We love you and we dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, real quickly, I know uh, Pastor Mike has already introduced me, but my name is Chance. This beautiful woman in the third row is my wife, Maria. We have been married for seven and a half years. We have three children who are not here. Um, They are a little rambunctious, and that's all I'll say. Um, Madeline is five, Chandler is three, Kenneth is six months. So we have three. That's what the Lord's given us, and he's not going to give us any more, okay? The quiver is full. Um, Thank you, sir. Excuse me, I have a tadpole in my throat that's trying to become a frog. Got it? I grew up as a pastor's son and a, of a Pentecostal pastor. Now, when you think of a Pentecostal pastor, you do not get my father. He doesn't get loud. He doesn't yell. He doesn't walk the pews. He doesn't shout. I've heard him speak in tongues maybe a handful of times, okay? Not a typical Pentecostal pastor. He is a man who loves God, who loves the Bible, and who loves people. My dad is called to be a pastor. There's no doubt in my mind about that. What I learned about spiritual gifts, I didn't really learn from dad. I learned it from church camp, which was a big thing in the denomination we were in. I learned it from personal study, which was a lot of it. And I learned it from being involved in a charismatic NAR church in Indiana. I'll get to that later. Right now, I want to first create kind of a distinction from my vantage point between Pentecostals and Charismatics. There is a slight difference. The Pentecostals basically focus on speaking in tongues. That's it. Now, yes, because of the NAR, because of Charismatic, some of that is trickling into Pentecostalism. But for for the most part, they they all talk about speaking in tongues, and that's it. I didn't even know about the other gifts until I got older and got involved in the NAR charismatic stuff. I'll just start start by talking about my first experience with speaking in tongues. I was at church camp, like I said. I was seven or eight, give or take. Um, Dad was actually the lifeguard that year, and he had dislocated his shoulder one morning. And I knew he had to go. He had to get surgery on his shoulder. That's all I knew. That evening, I'm worried about Dad. So I go up for prayer. And I start feeling people lay their hands on me, people who I know, my cabin leader, other people who knew my family. And I'm an emotional person, so I started to cry because I was emotional because all these people who are around me loved me. Now, I want to interrupt my story and say, with every experience I had, you can pinpoint it with three different things. Emotionalism, hype, and with a lot of it, the power of suggestion. Okay? So right now we've already established I was already emotional. The speaker that week was speaking on, guess what? Speaking in tongues. So there's the hype. Then number three, of course now I'm emotional and I'm crying, and the speaker that week said, Chance, God is trying to give you the gift of speaking in tongues. You need to let go of your mouth and your brain and speak. That's what I did. You want to know what it sounded like? That, 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 that's about it. But that was called speaking in tongues. That, that simple baby talk, I was told was speaking in tongues. It's not, in case you're curious, okay? Now, as I got older and began speaking in tongues, I would pick up what I heard from other people. So if I heard someone praying, shit about a Honda, then I would add that to my da-da-da, shit about a Honda. 
If I heard somebody else say, shoulda bought a Kia, now I'm going to add that. So now it's da da da, shoulda bought a Honda, but I bought a Kia. There you go. Now I've just spoken tongues in front of you. And guess what? It means nothing. It took me a while to realize I did not have the gift of speaking in tongues. You know what I had the gift of? Making up a bunch of vowels and consonants and putting them together and sounding like a fool. I know that now. I didn't know that then. When you're deceived, you don't see the truth. That was the big thing. I was deceived. I did not know the truth. Now, I never knew what I was saying when I spoke in tongues, of course, because I wasn't saying anything, right? There was no interpreter. I never even heard about the interpretation of tongues, again, until I got into the NAR charismatic stuff, okay? I was told I was speaking in a personal prayer language, which, guess what? I had no scripture to back it up. I was never given a scripture to back that up. I was just told, that's your personal prayer language. Okay, praise the Lord. Here I go. I was also told that speaking in tongues is a way to edify yourself, which is a twisting of the scripture in 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, which Pastor Mike explained very well last week. I couldn't have done it any better than Pastor Mike did last week when he spoke about speaking in tongues. So they twisted that scripture of 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, that speaking in tongues is edifying yourself. That's what I was told, and I ran with it. And another part about speaking in tongues, and this sounds really vain, so I'm going to give you all a good opportunity to think terribly of me, okay? Speaking in tongues made me feel more spiritual than other people. That was part of the deception. They made you feel like, oh, you're closer to God because you speak in tongues. Praise the Lord. That's part of the deception. The, especially in the charismatic world, it's not about God. It's about you. It's about you being empowered. It's about you being spirit-filled. Spirit it's about you doing something. God's not, God's not there. They give lip service to it's all about the glory of God. In reality, it's not. It's about man. So for 10 years... Pretty much all it was was speaking in tongues and being slain in the spirit. And I don't know if you covered this or not. You didn't? Oh, good. I give you something to preach about. Um, <laughs> but that, that was another thing I wanted. I wanted to be slain in the spirit, which is a very short explanation. As someone, you know, touches you or if you're Benny Hinn, just boom, just bops them on the head and you fall out. In case you're curious, that's not scriptural either, okay? But what it does... It, <laughs> It's hard to explain, and I sound like a fool explaining it. But the only way I can say it is this. It gives you a spiritual high. And for years, that's what I wanted. I wanted this spiritual high that came from speaking in tongues, that came from getting slain in the spirit. It was a drug. And that's what it is in these charismatic churches. They're seeking the experience. They're seeking the encounter with God. And that's what I sought after for 20-something years. It was an encounter. It was an experience. When I was about 19, that's when I was introduced to um, a charismatic preacher who started teaching me about other spiritual gifts. A big kickstart with this is when he took me to a charismatic NAR church in Indiana. Going there, that was, that's what really kick-started a lot of my deeper deception. Uh, that's when I first encountered the, a personal prophecy. A man came up and said he had a word from God for me. And he said what it was and hit my belly and there I'm on the floor. And that's where that high kicked in again. That's where that drug kicked in again. That that's what I wanted. I wanted that spiritual high. I wanted that encounter with God. And I wanted to be talked to directly from God. 
And I thought I had to hear it from a man who called himself a prophet. When in reality, and allow me to quote Justin Peters, if you want to hear God speak to you, read the Bible. If you want to hear him speak audibly, read it out loud. Okay? That's not what I was taught. I was taught I have to have a prophet say a word over me and get that spiritual high again. And quite frankly, I would even get jealous if other people had a prophetic word spoken over them and I didn't. That's how much this deception goes, church. The experience became a drug. I was looking for that next spiritual high. I was looking for that next encounter with God. That became important. Not the word of God. That encounter was what I was after. And in the charismatic churches, they give lip service to the Bible being the be-all, end-all. They give lip service to the Bible is the word of God. But that's not what they practice. That's not what they preach. The services aren't about hearing the word of God. The service is about waiting for the preacher to stop preaching so that we can have altar call, so that we can have another encounter, so we can have another prophetic word, so we can get on the, the prayer line and get slain in the spirit again. That's what it was about. That's what it still is about. So just real quick on prophecy. I was taught that any spirit-filled Christian could prophesy. But I was also taught it was separate from the office of a prophet. Which, when you hear it, doesn't make a lick of sense, but that's how they teach it, is that you can have the office of a prophet. Oh, but everybody can prophesy, because if you're spirit-filled, you can prophesy. And the office of a prophet was held up to where that was, that was the goal. And for me, it was. I wanted, to be, uh, the, I wanted to have the office of the prophet and be prophet Chance Massey and be this big, huge, important person. I'm being really transparent with you guys, okay? But this is the deception. This is what the mess I was in. Um, I was also taught how to prophesy. Which makes me think of what Pastor Mike has been saying. That the gifts cannot be, what? Taught. But I was taught how to prophesy. Here's how it works. God will give you a word, maybe two. And once you say those words, everything else will just flow out of you. Right. I don't think that's how it happened in the Old Testament. That's just a guess. But I'm pretty sure that's not how it worked. But yes, God would give you a word and, and you just say, you know, whatever comes, don't think about it. That's what I was told. Don't think. Do you hear the deception? Don't think about it. Just say it. And that's a word from the Lord. Right. It wasn't, for the record. I was a false prophet. Let me be even more transparent. I was a false prophet. And I prophesied falsely. When you really want to get down to it, I broke the commandment that says, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Amen. Because when you say, thus saith the Lord, and then you say whatever popped into your head, you're taking the name of God in vain. Because as it says in the book of Jer uh, Jeremiah, God hath not sent the prophet, God did not say. Miracles and healings were always talked about, never seen. I would hear, and it would always be from the person behind the pulpit. It would always be the speaker saying, Oh, I was in this country, and the, and the blind were healed, and, and the lame walked, and yet da 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 and, Or I was at this church, and, and this happened, and this happened, and glory to God. I never saw any of it. It was all story. It was all myths and fables as far as I'm concerned now. And it's part of that hype to build an expectation of what God's going to do. So that's a very brief look at what I was involved in for 20 years. Looking back, I can start to see times where I would see something 
or experience something that didn't feel right. And it didn't make any sense. And I can see it, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I can see now God starting to show me certain things. I'll give you one very brief example. When I was at that in, uh, church in Indiana, there was twice where this happened, where I was on the prayer line. Again, I was seeking that high. And a woman came up, and the only way I can explain it is I felt like I was hypnotized because she would start praying for me, and somehow she started rocking me, and then before I knew it, I was on the floor without any thought, without any realization of what was happening. It was like I was hypnotized. And I remember thinking, laying there, feeling like a, a dummy. Man, that was weird. <laughs> but I can't get up yet. That, that's something else. It, it's really messed up. You can't just fall down and get back up. You have to let the Lord work on you. That's what I was told. Don't get up. Just lay there. <laughs> it's been an hour. I know the Lord's still working on you. Bless God. Bless God. <laughs> It sounds silly, but again, that's, that's the deception. I was told that was, I didn't write this one down. I was told that was God's operating table. If he knocks you down, just, just lay there for a while and bring a pillow with you. Because um, those floors were never comfortable. Anyways, uh, again, I just want to reiterate, you don't see the truth when you're deceived. Amen. And I know I'm, I'm laughing about it and I'm making light of it. But looking back, it was bad. And looking back, it's really, it's only by the... It's only by the grace of God that I got out of this. If it were not for the grace of God, I would certainly not be in this church. If it were not for the grace of God, I'd still be messed up in that. So let me share you the big three events, what's what I call them, the big three events that really, that God did, and I'm telling you, it was boom, boom, boom. I didn't have much time to breathe in between these events. The first one was all of the failed Trump prophecies. <laughs> I was, I'm telling you what, guys, I was high on the prophetic Trump train, okay? I, and I actually just recently read that 70 Prophets and prophetesses. Prophet. Never mind. I don't speak very good English. Okay, I'm from Oklahoma. Give me a break. But 70 prophets prophesied that Trump was going to be elected for a second term. That Trump is God's president. That Trump is uh, uh, somehow connected to King Cyrus in, I believe, the book of Isaiah. And that Trump's going to win and Trump's going to win. And Trump lost. Now, we can talk all day long about how he lost. But the fact is, 70 prophets lied. They took God's name in vain because guess what? Trump lost. Number two. Well, and that's when I started. So with number one, I started questioning the gift of prophecy. Especially since I thought I was a prophet. Especially since I thought I could prophesy. Well, those 70 people, a lot of them with pretty big names, they all got it wrong. Number two, my Uncle Todd. My Uncle Todd got COVID uh, the end of February 2021. Todd, godly man. He loved the Lord. I remember being in church with him and worshiping the Lord. And, and he loved the Lord. And he, he, had, he was in perfect health. And, you know, he was, of course, married to my aunt, my dad's younger sister. Um, and they had a son. And, you know, Evan is, you know, he's young and he needs his father. And I remember praying, you know, we're a Christian church, or excuse me, a Christian family, Dad Gummit. So we're praying for Todd. And I remember, there's a, micro, there's a thing there. I probably shouldn't be on the podium. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> Watch too much Steve Lawson there, Pastor Mike, getting really emphatic. I digress. Um, but I remember going to work praying for Todd and declaring, <laughs> declaring he was healed. I didn't ask God. I didn't request of God. I declared Todd was healed. Because Todd's a godly man and we're a godly family. And God, it's always your will to heal. That's one of the deceptions that the charismatic churches teach. 
is that it's always God's will to heal. And I remember praying that, Lord, it's your will to heal Todd, and I know you're going to heal Todd. Todd died. He died. My godly uncle, leaving my dad's baby sister, leaving my cousin Evan without a father. Todd died. It was not the Lord's will to heal Todd. Now that whole, I mean, you can talk all day about God's will. Sometimes it's hard for us to swallow. Let me tell you, it was hard for my family to swallow. It's still hard for my family to swallow. But in God's sovereignty, which is not a word you hear in charismatic churches, in God's sovereignty, he took Todd to be with him. But that's when I started questioning whether it was God's will to heal. And I started questioning healing and miracles. And then number three, excuse me, that tadpole's back. Number three, we're at um, the Pentecostal church that Marie and I just left last year. And we're doing a sermon series on Jesus, which is a great thing to preach about when you're in a church, is Jesus. We did a nine-week series. The pastor elected me to choose two topics and preach on them. And he elected his son Samuel to preach two topics um, and preach on them. And I picked two good ones. Man, I chose Jesus the... Um, well, foot, I can't even remember. But I chose two good ones, man. And I, you know, I studied and, and they were good. You know, I think one of them was Jesus the prophet and the other one was Jesus the something else. It doesn't really matter what mine was. Um, mine wasn't that important. But one of the topics was Jesus the human. And my first thought was, man, that sounds really boring. I'm going to let someone else preach that one. I ain't preaching that one. That's boring. And Samuel preached that one. And my first thought was, well, that's boring. But I like Samuel. And Samuel's a good teacher, so I'm sure I'll get something out of it. So Samuel starts preaching from John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 1 about Jesus being the human. And he makes a point to say the following. Jesus did not do his miracles as a man, but as God. Now, that sounds like a really simple quote, right? In the charismatic world, they teach that Jesus did his miracles as a man, not as God. They teach that Jesus did his miracles as a man, fully baptized and fully anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that's how he did it, because that's how you can do it, because that's how the charismatic church teaches you. They want to build you. There it goes back to self again. They want to build you up. And in the process, they bring Jesus down. So I had in my head the charismatic teaching that no, Jesus did his miracles because he was a man anointed by God and baptized by the Holy Spirit. And then Samuel just very simply says that Jesus did his miracles because he was truly God and truly man. And that he did his miracles in his divinity as God. I don't remember anything else Samuel preached on that Sunday. Because now I'm lost in thought and I'm seeing scripture and I can't argue with it anymore. And it hits me like a ton of bricks. My theology is wrong. And I remember going home and I began to seek answers. I began to seek after the truth. I began listening and reading from men, some of them I never even heard of, like R.C. Sproul, like Steve Lawson like Justin Peters. I remember listening to John MacArthur. Y'all, I was told in the charismatic church to avoid John MacArthur because he spoke against the charismatic gifts. I was told to avoid him completely. This morning I have a John MacArthur study Bible. Anywho. So do I. Yeah, yeah I, I noticed that too. I was like, yeah, I recognize that right there. I began listening um, to men and women, on, well, mostly men, on YouTube, the Kozars, the Longs, Chris Rosebor, just, uh, I already mentioned Justin Peters. But I started listening to them explain the flaws in the charismatic and Pentecostal church. I remember re uh, listening to the Strange Fire Conference, which is a conference that um, John MacArthur did, exposing 
the charismatic church and exposing their wrong theology and exposing how they view the gifts and how they view them unbiblically and uncorrectly, which again, Pastor Mike has done a great job these past 10 weeks explaining that to you guys. I remember watching American Gospel and being convicted because I did not know the true gospel. I knew the prosperity gospel. I knew the word of faith gospel, which I haven't even touched on yet. I didn't know the true gospel until I watched American Gospel and I start reading the word and I'm pricked at the heart. And I start um, reading, um, well, I start listening to the book, or excuse me, listen to the sermons of Strange Fire and I started reading um, John MacArthur's second book on the charismatic gifts, which is called Charismatic Chaos. And I remember driving home from work, and for, for days, I was, every time I was in the car, I was praying and wrestling with God, really, is what I was doing. Over everything I was reading, everything I was listening, everything I saw in the Word, and I was wrestling with God. And, and I remember kind of thinking, I didn't really say it out loud, but I remember thinking, what about all this stuff I experienced? And then yet again it hit me. My experience has to bow at the word of God. Amen. My experience had to take a back seat. And the Bible had to be the driver. That's not how I had been operating. I had been operating sure on experience. I wanted that high. I wanted that addiction. I wanted that drug of that spiritual high. And then later I'd find a Bible verse that maybe sort of kind of explained it. My experience had to bow at the Word of God. It was not until I realized that that I was free. Once, once that hit me, then I felt that freedom. Let's look again at 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All, everybody say all. All scripture is inspired by God. Other translations say God breathed. And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. When, when I realized that in the car, this is the verse that came up to me, and I went home and, and I looked at it, and I realized that if all Scripture is God-breathed, and if all Scripture is profitable, and if all Scripture is adequate and perfect and good for the equipping of the Lord, then I don't need a personal prophecy. Then I don't need to speak in gibberish. I don't need to seek after miracles and healings. I can have faith in the ones that the Lord provided. I can have faith in the ones that happened right in here. If all scripture is God breathed, I don't need that spiritual high. I need faith in the word of God. Amen. Once I realized that, I was free. I was then a cessationist which y'all have heard the explanation of what a cessationist is. I became a cessationist in my car, going to a Pentecostal church. That doesn't go well, in case you're curious. You get real uncomfortable real quickly. So all of that happened in the summer of 2021. Maria and our family left that Pentecostal church in February of 22. Um... It was not easy, but it had to be done. It's that simple. My parents, especially dad, wanted us to come to their church. I had to lovingly decline. I remember being on the phone with dad, and I said, Dad, I'm not a Pentecostal anymore. Um, so like I said, we left that Pentecostal church. I actually tried to get a job at a Southern Baptist church, which didn't work out, and it's the Lord's will that it didn't work out, 
because I didn't need to go from leadership to leadership. Okay, the church we were in, I wasn't just there. I was, again, one of the ministers there. I was the worship leader there for five years. Marie and I were youth leaders there for about four years, if I remember correctly. We were heavily involved. I didn't need to go from leadership to leadership. I needed to heal, and I needed to sit under a pastor who loved the word, who exposited the word, who would love me and minister to me. And we found that church. Um, in March of 22, we started going to a um, good Bible-believing Baptist church. Um, we were welcomed and loved right from the beginning. And they loved us. We are there. We're learning. We're getting involved. We're healing. And it's really been a great blessing to be free. Real quick before I end, turn to Psalms 19. I just want to read this passage real quick and then I'll sit down. Psalms 19. It's actually interesting. Psalms 119, as I'm sure you all know, is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's the longest psalm, easily. Um, and it's all about the Word of God. It's all about the law, the statutes, the commandments. Um, it's interesting that in Psalms 19, you see these several verses, starting at verse 7, that kind of eclipse what Psalms 119 is about. Starting at verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. I just want to stop and say that the law of the Lord restored and healed my soul and is still doing so. Let's read that verse again and then keep going. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Verse 11, Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Pastor Mike.